Father Cashin was invited to St. Benedict's Abbey in Still River, Massachusetts in the early October 2013 to give a series of conferences on praying without ceasing, drawing on scripture, the liturgy, and the fathers, Father Cashin gives us some tips on how to pray better. In this day and age, we want quick fixes and easy answers, but we can only learn to pray better by doing it more frequently, and this takes time. Father Cashin is the founder and prior of the Monastery of San Benedetto, located at the birthplace of St. Benedict in Norcia, Italy. Father Cashin has remained on faculty at the Pontifical Liturgical Institute in Rome, and since 2010 has been a consultor to the Congregation of Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments. Father Cashin became a Benedictine monk at St. Mindred in southern Indiana in 1980 and was ordained a priest in 1984. He earned his doctorate in sacred liturgy from Sant Salomo in 1989. He has given retreats and talks throughout his life as a monk. Here is part six of Father Cashin's 10-part series on prayer. This one continues his previous talk on personal prayer, drawing on lessons from the rule of St. Benedict. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. John Cashin, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I understand that it's Father Augustine's birthday today. Is that right? Who told you that? Little birdie. I just want to tell a story about birthdays before we begin the serious part. Um, Abbot Timothy of St. Meinrad, under whom I entered, he, it was a real big deal for him to say, now we don't celebrate birthdays in the monastery. We celebrate names days, not birthdays. Well, one day, uh, Father Lambert, then Father Lambert, uh, before he became abbot, went into Father Abbot Timothy asking permission. He says, Father Abbot, May I please go out tonight? It's my birthday. And Father Abbot Timothy, who was kind of grouchy, he said, Now, Father, he always pushed up his glasses like this. In general, we don't celebrate birthdays in the monastery. And Father Abbot Lambert said, I know, that's why I want to go out. <laughs> but I'm sure you don't do things like that. <laughs> well, from the um, ridiculous to the sublime, uh, we want to talk about one word prayer um, as that uh, tradition is handed on by Cashin. Uh, we've seen that the Egyptian desert tradition emphasized this one word prayer. In fact, somewhere or other, I think in the, in the Confessions of St. Augustine, but in some writing of his, he mentions that the Egyptians have this custom. Uh, that forms the basis for the development of the Jesus prayer in the East, but the rosary in the West is very much in the same, same line. That is, it's a short prayer that you repeat over and over again, uh, and it has the same effect of concentrating the mind and uh, freeing you from, from extraneous thoughts. Now, what I'd, I'd like to say about this one-word prayer, or and the the uh, text from Cashin that I want to uh, read to you, it remains for me an ideal, not an established practice. Perhaps uh, I've always wanted to do more, you know, wanted to be a better prayer, but perhaps I lack the, the conversatio necessary, that is the, the proper way of life, because I'm too busy and distracted with uh, serving uh, as a uh, as Father described the other day with Martha and Mary. And so I never seem to have the time, or I don't make the time, or have excuses not to dedicate to this form of prayer. I do have one experience, though, from long ago that might be useful to you. I was um, studying German and lived fairly close to the monastery of Münster Schwarzach, one of the St. Italian houses. And they happened to have a, 
uh, a weekend retreat on prayer. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll go to that. And it was led by, I don't remember his name anymore, but somebody, a monk of the house, very much influenced by Zen. And that's how the whole thing was kind of organized. You know, you had to sit on these little pillows or something and keep your back straight and sit there for like hours and hours. Well, I took advantage of, of that somewhat strange uh, context to, to use the Jesus prayer instead of some other mantra or something. And uh, even though I got very angry at this, um, at this monk for doing ridiculous things, and the anger disturbed my prayer, <laughs> um, nonetheless, when the whole thing was over and I was going back in the bus, looking out the window, I noticed, much to my surprise, that the Jesus prayer was going on inside me, and I didn't even have to uh, say the words myself. That is because of that short period of time, two or three days, of really concentration using this form of prayer, the simply a psychological effect is that it, it, uh, it starts working by itself. Well, maybe hermits have a, a better chance of doing that, uh, but I think that's a fairly reasonable principle. Um, if, if you use this form of prayer, uh, consistently, then it, uh, it begins to pray within you without you having to do anything about it. For this teaching on one word prayer, we have to go back to the pre-Benedictine tradition because St. Benedict doesn't talk about it explicitly. But it's found in uh, Cashin, especially in Conferences 9 and 10, where he gives a highly developed theology of prayer and this practical uh, guidance also. But first, he lays down a basic principle, uh, saying that the, the goal of every, of every monk and the perfection of his heart incline him to constant and uninterrupted perseverance in prayer. And as much as human frailty allows, it strives after an unchanging and, continually, and continual tranquility of mind and perpetual purity. So he talks about a state of prayer, that, that's the goal. Not just this particular uh, technique of prayer, but the state of prayer that it leads to. The same ideal of a state of prayer is expressed in the introduction to Conference 10, where the Abba Isaac says, we will reach this stage of prayer when every love, every desire, every effort Every undertaking, every thought of ours, everything that we live, that we speak, that we breathe, will be God. And when that unity which the Father now has with the Son, and which the Son has with the Father, will be carried over into our understanding and our mind, so that just as He loves us with a sincere and pure and indissoluble love, we too may be joined to Him with a perpetual and inseparable love and so united with him that whatever we breathe, whatever we understand, whatever we speak, may be God. So that's the goal of the monk. How do we get there? Well, in Conference 9, Cashin lays the foundations for his teaching uh, on prayer that will come in Conference 10. Uh, and Conference 9 establishes these uh, conditions for a life of prayer. Uh, first of all, we've already talked about these somewhat, so this is a review. Uh, the practical life, the bios practicos is necessary. That is the, what we call the active life, not meaning apostolic life, but active in terms of dealing with your vices and your virtues. Uh, that practical life is, is helped by withdrawal from worldly preoccupations and by cultivating a certain stability of mind. Our thoughts tend to be like monkeys in a tree jumping about, and it's very hard to get them to, to keep still. Uh, Cashin talks about various character, characteristics of prayer. He goes over the four types of prayer according to the New Testament, which we heard in the readings this week. 
Uh, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made. So he talks about those four things. He gives a commentary on the Lord's Prayer. And in the end, there's a discussion on compunction and tears. But all of that is kind of a, a preparation, laying the groundwork for uh, his more mystical teaching. In this introduction, Cashin, on various occasions, uses the expression prayer of fire or something similar. Let me give you a few of those citations. We pray when we renounce this world and pledge that dead to every, dearth, every earthly deed and to an earthly way of life, we will serve the Lord with utter earnestness of heart. In Latin, tota intentione cordis. Now remember, that's exactly the same expression that Benedict uses in the chapter on the oratory, to pray with intentione cordis, this intensity of heart. In what does that consist? Well, we know, Cashin says, or Abba Isaac, but it's Cashin speaking, we know that frequently very fervent and fiery prayers arise, preaches initas, ignited prayers, you might say. In another place, he says, he describes an advanced state of prayer of those who are wrapped by their fervent hearts to that fiery prayer initam orationem, which is the, the, the goal of the monk. And after his uh, commentary on the Our Father, he says this prayer, that is the Our Father, although it seems to contain the utter fullness of perfection, inasmuch as it was instituted and established on the authority of the Lord himself, nevertheless raises God's uh, servants to that condition which we characterized previously as more sublime. This prayer, the Our Father, leads them by a higher stage to that fiery and indeed, more properly speaking, world, wordless prayer. Once again, inyam orationem, which is known and experienced by very few. So Cashin talks about this fiery prayer as something out of the ordinary, but nonetheless known and experienced. Abba Isaac, after finishing his introduction uh, to prayer, uh, adds the comment, for this reason, prayer should be made frequently, but briefly. Now, when he says briefly here, he doesn't mean the same thing that St. Benedict meant in terms of uh, prayer while prostrated, and that shouldn't be too long. Here he means a very short uh, verse of the scriptures, that kind of brief prayer which is repeated. After all this long introduction, uh, Cashin and his buddy Germanus remain rather perplexed. Uh, they say, oh, this is all very nice, but how are we supposed to do this? Because the old man hadn't yet given them more specific instruction. And the old man hadn't given them specific instruction because of this uh, kind of keeping holy things secret unless somebody really manifests that they're worthy. In fact, Abba, Abba Isaac responds to them. Now I'm paraphrasing. I usually don't say this to just anybody, is basically what his, uh, his point is. But since you've proven yourselves sincere, then he says, I do not fear to risk the reproach of betrayal or light-mindedness if I divulge the things that I kept back when I was speaking about the perfection of prayer in the previous discussion. So for the ancients, to, to talk about these things to somebody who's really not worthy is to betray uh, a trust. So they test people, just as St. Benedict tests monks when they come to the monastery, by giving them a hard time, so don't be surprised. Uh, so also, in the teaching on prayer, uh, the elder gives a hard time too, or tests the people before uh, coming to the heart of the matter. But he, he uh, agrees to do it, Abba Isaac, and says, okay, now the formula for this spiritual theoria, 
the spiritual contemplation uh, I will transmit to you. <coughs> and this is what he says. He says that he received this from other uh, fathers of the desert. Just as this was handed down to us by a few of the oldest fathers who were left, so also we pass it on to none but the most exceptional who truly deserve it. This then is the formula proposed to you as absolutely necessary for possessing the perpetual awareness of God. So they're waiting for something extraordinary. And what does he say? O oh God, come to my assistance. O oh Lord, make haste to help me. For us, that's not extraordinary at all because we say it so often. It's just kind of, um, we say it by rote. But this whole build-up of the entire Conference 9 and this whole uh, uh, protection of the mystery comes to that very simple verse. And Abba, Abba Isaac says, Not without reason has this verse been selected from out of the whole body of Scripture. For it takes up all the emotions that can be applied to human nature and with great <coughs> correctness and accuracy it adjusts itself to every condition and every attack. That is, when we say, O oh God, come to my assistance, we're invoking his aid. O oh Lord, make haste to help me is saying the same thing. It's, it's a Hebrewism. You say the same thing twice, but in a different way. Uh, you're, you're invoking God and asking for his help. Now, there's kind of a, a panegyric on this prayer, all the wonderful things that it, that it will do for you. This prayer contains an invocation of God in the face of any crisis. It contains the humility of a devout confession, the watchfulness of concern and of constant fear, a consciousness of of one's own frailty, the assurance of being heard, confidence in a protection that is always present and at hand. For whoever calls unceasingly on his protector is sure that he is always present. Then he, he goes into a, a description of all the ways that this prayer is useful, and he does something just like Evagrius did this morning, that in the Antireticos. That is, he goes through the eight principal faults and he says why this prayer is especially useful for cutting off each of those thoughts. Unlike Evagrius, he doesn't go through the whole Bible and come with 500 different scriptural passages. He just comes up with one and says this is good for everything. But the, the description of, of, of this, though, is quite interesting and sometimes amusing. Where do you start when you're dealing with the vices? You start with gluttony, of course. If I am seized by the passion of gluttony, look for food that is unheard of in the desert, that is, they had pretty simple food. What if I want caviar or something, and all I get is bread? That's gluttony. If I look for food that is unheard of in the desert, by the way, I don't like caviar, and feel myself in the midst of the stark desert drawn unwilling to, unwillingly to the desire for sumptuous meals, by the aromas of such things coming in upon me, then I should say, O oh God, come to my assistance, O oh Lord, make haste to help me. If I can open a little parenthesis, uh, in Norcha, we have two buildings, and to go from one building to the next, you have to pass by the chimney, or the, 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 yeah, the chimney of a restaurant, which is right down below. And they specialize, of course, in grilled meats, and we don't eat meat in the monastery. And so you walk from one room to the, from one building to the next, and there's this, this, this aroma, you know, of grilled meats that your nose just kind of follows as you pass by. Well, that prompts the demon of gluttony. So we should say when we pass by, Oh God, come to my assistance. The next uh, uh, vice is fornication. If because of an attack of the flesh, and oftentimes... Um, uh, sexual temptation is, if it's very intense, you can feel it in your, in your stomach. If because of an attack of the flesh, weakness of stomach puts me off, and because of this uh, temptation I should fast more, 
but I can't fast more because I'm afflicted with dry bowels and constipation, then in order that my desire may be fulfilled, or at least that the seething emotions of fleshly lust may be laid to rest, without resorting to more severe fasting, I should pray, O oh God, come to my assistance, O oh Lord, make haste to help me. He had stomach problems. If a headache disturbs me and hinders me when I want to attend to my reading, if at the third hour, when they did Lexio, sleep causes my face to fall upon the sacred page, and if I'm compelled to prolong or anticipate the established time of rest, and finally, if the overwhelming pressure of sleep is forcing me to absent myself from the canonical singing of the Psalms at the Synaxis, this guy's in a bad way. He can't keep his eyes open, he's falling asleep on the Bible, and he's going to bed instead of going to church. If that should happen, I mean, it's flowery language, but we have to get to the, to the heart of the matter. If that should happen, what should you do? You should say, oh God, come to my assistance. Oh Lord, make haste to help me. Then what about insomnia? If sleep is kept from my eyes, and I see that for many nights I'm worn out by a sleeplessness of diabolical origin, and if a quiet night's rest is completely cut off from my eyes, then I should pray with sighs, O oh God, come to my assistance, O oh Lord, make haste to help me. It's good for anything. If carnal titillation suddenly pricks me while I am still struggling against the vices, and if it tries with its caressing pleasurableness to get me to consent as I lie sleeping, then I should cry out, O oh God, come to my assistance, O oh Lord, make haste to help me. What about uh, the other, uh, the, the vices of the emotions, anger uh, or sadness? If I am disquieted by the urges of anger, avarice or sadness, and if I am being pressed to cut off the gentleness that I have proposed to myself and that is dear to me, then lest the disturbance of rage carry me off into a poisonous bitterness, let me cry out with loud groaning, O oh God, come to my assistance, O oh Lord, make haste to help me. He goes on, if I am severely tried by transports of acedia, we could say depression or just feeling kind of blah. If I'm really tried by that, if I am assailed by vainglory or pride, and if my mind is subtly fancying that others are negligent or lukewarm, I'm not, of course, I'm, I'm great, but they're lukewarm. Then, lest this wicked suggestion of the enemy overcome me, I should pray with a contrite heart, O oh God, come to my assistance, O oh Lord, make haste to help me. <clears throat> if I'm boiling over with a multitude of different distractions of soul and with a fickle heart, and I'm unable to control my wandering thoughts, and I can't even pour out my prayer without interruption, and without imagining foolish fantasies and recalling words and deeds, and if I feel myself constricted by such dry barrenness that I feel I am not begetting any spiritual thoughts at all, real aridity and complete distraction, then what should my response be? O oh God, come to my assistance, O oh Lord, make haste to help me. Up until now, it's all negative things. If I if I'm attacked by all these demons, uh, then I should use this prayer, but also for positive things. If, on the other hand, I feel that thanks to the Holy Spirit's visitation, I have attained focus of soul, steadfastness of thought, and joy of heart, along with an unspeakable gladness and ecstasy of mind, and with an abundance of spiritual thoughts, I have, due to a sudden illumination from the Lord, perceived an overflow of holy ideas, which had been completely hidden from me before, then in order that I might deserve to abide longer in these, I should frequently and anxiously, anxiously cry, O oh God, come to my assistance, O oh Lord, make haste to help me. So whether it's in good times or in bad times, uh, this is the prayer to use. He summarizes and connects this with uh, a state of prayer, of constant awareness of God. This verse should be poured out in unceasing prayer, 
so that we may be delivered in adversity and preserved and not puffed up in prosperity. You should meditate constantly on this verse in your heart. You should not stop repeating it when you are doing any kind of work or performing some service or are on a journey. Meditate on it while sleeping. How do you meditate while sleeping? Well, it has to be there in your head before. We know just from experience, if you're worried about something and you go to bed and it's on your mind, when you wake up in the morning, that's the first thing that comes to your mind. There's a whole psychology of sleep. And so if you're thinking this verse before you go to bed, then it'll work while you're sleeping and you'll remember it when you awake. Not only that, he's a very frank sort of fellow. Uh, meditate on it while sleeping and eating and attending to the needs of nature. So if you're sitting on the throne, well, don't just, you know, waste your time. Pray this prayer. <clears throat> this heart's reflection will not only preserve you unharmed from every attack, but will also purge you of every vice and lead you to the theoria, the contemplation of invisible and heavenly realities and raise you to that ineffably ardent prayer, that is the fiery prayer, which is experienced by very few. Now he's going to connect this with Deuteronomy, that passage that says, Hear, O, uh, uh, hear, o Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, you will meditate on this while you, uh, when you walk, when you sleep, when you lie down, put it on the, on the doorposts of your house. Remember that passage, chapter 6? Let sleep overtake you as you meditate upon this verse until you are formed by having, by having used it ceaselessly and are in the habit of repeating it even while asleep. Let this be the first thing that comes to you when you awake. Let it anticipate every other thought as you get up. Let it send you to your knees as you arise from bed. Your morning prayer. Let it bring you from there to every work and activity. Let it accompany you at all times. You should meditate on this according to the command of the lawgiver when sitting at home and going out on a journey, when sleeping and rising. You should write this on the threshold and doors of your mouth. You should place it on the walls of your house, in the recesses of your heart, so that when you prostrate yourself in prayer, this may be your chant as you bow down. And when you rise from there and go about all the occupations of life, it may be your constant prayer. Let the mind hold ceaselessly to this formula, above all, until it has been strengthened by constantly using and continually meditating upon it, until it renounce, renounces and rejects the whole wealth and abundance of thoughts. Now what he's going to say here is that instead of a multitude of thoughts, uh, a richness of thoughts, we need the poverty of one thought. So. Uh, straightened by the poverty of this verse, the soul will very easily attain to that gospel beatitude, which holds the first place among the other beatitudes, for it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Sometimes we have to preach on the beatitudes. We usually don't think, when we talk about blessed are the poor in spirit, of using just one word for our prayer and not a whole bunch of words. But that's what Cashin is saying. Uh, the poverty of this verse is the poverty of the poor in spirit. Well, this is a, it's a wonderful ideal, but of course takes um, a great deal of discipline and practice. There are some remarkable results, according to Cashman, uh, for, for practicing this kind of prayer. And I'd like to just mention two of them that he elaborates upon. One is something uh, rather um, unexpected. He says, if the monk is accustomed to praying in this way, uh, and he uses the example of, uh, of uh, deer uh, feeding on the mountain, he says, the monk thriving on the, the pasture that the scriptures offer, and taking into himself all the dispositions of the Psalms, he will begin to repeat them, the Psalms, and to treat them 
in his profound compunction of heart, not as if they were composed by the prophet, by David, but as if they were his own utterances and his own prayer. Certainly he will consider that they are directed to his own person, and he will recognize that their words were not only achieved by and in the prophet in times past, but that they are daily borne out and fulfilled in him. Now, Cashin's language is a little bit elaborate and uh, sometimes a bit tedious, but the point is uh, there'll be an intuitive understanding of the scriptures. You'll, you'll read the Psalms and you'll say, oh, I would have said it that way myself. Uh, I think the fathers often read the scriptures that way. They had an intuitive uh, feel for how to interpret it. Uh, and if you if you read the fathers enough, you'll know how they would go about it. So if I'm, if I have to prepare a homily for, for Sunday or some other day, very often I read something and say, now, St. Augustine would probably do this with that. That is, you, you pick up a certain intuition about how, how to understand the scriptures. He goes on to elaborate upon that. For divine scripture is clearer and its inmost organs, so to speak, are revealed to us when our experience, our experience of God, our experience of prayer, not only perceives but even anticipates its thought, and the meanings of the words are disclosed to us not by exegesis but by experience. When we have the same dispos disposition in our heart with which each psalm was sung or written down, then we shall become like its author, grasping its significance beforehand rather than afterward, as if we were the authors ourselves and we would express ourselves in that way. We've been talking about the Psalms quite a bit in these days, but, uh, and, and the difficulty that we have in, in uh, really absorbing the Psalms. There are all sorts of obstacles. Uh, but uh, Cashin is a, a um, gives witness uh, that if you, if you do that long enough, if you live in the world of the Psalms, then it becomes uh, connatural, um, and you begin to think in those categories. And therefore, the meaning of the Psalms becomes intuitively clear to you. So that's a very, a very beautiful result of this kind of prayer, uh, which perhaps wouldn't, we wouldn't have thought of if Cashin hadn't said it to us. The other uh, result of this kind of prayer is what I would call a state of prayer. Not that you have to be saying this verse all the time, uh, just as the... Um, the, the pilgrim, the Russian pilgrim, even though he counted thousands of uh, times of saying the Jesus prayer, uh, and that's necessary to get you started, but after a certain point, you have you don't have to be saying it all the time. That it, it just establishes a state of prayer. Cashin says there are three things that stabilize a wandering mind, namely vigils, meditation. By meditation, he means memorizing the scriptures and prayer. Being faithful and constantly attentive to them produces a solid firmness of soul. Yet this cannot be achieved unless by tireless constancy in work dedicated to the holy practices of the synobium we have first completely renounced every care and anxiety of the present life. That is the conversatio once again. The, the, the context of the prayer is necessary. Thus we shall be able to fulfill the apostolic command, pray without ceasing. For whoever is in the habit of praying only at the hour when the knees are bent, prays very little. But whoever is distracted by any sort of wandering of heart, even when he's kneeling, never prays. And therefore, we have to be outside the hour of prayer, or we want to be when we are praying. For the mind, at the time of its prayer, is necessarily formed by what, by what went on previously. And when it is praying, the mind is either raised to the heavens or brought low to the earth, depending on the thoughts on which it was dwelling before it prayed. 
So the context of our life and the habit of prayer, um, the habit of prayer is a result of this application to the one word prayer that Cashin recommends. Now Saint Benedict is heir to this tradition because he recommends the um, institutes and the conferences uh, as reading every night before Compline. That means his monks heard it all the time. And in the Middle Ages, to, to know whether the monks read Cashin or not, you, all you have to do is count the manuscripts that, that still exist of the institutes and the conferences, and there are hundreds of them. Uh, it was common reading. So St. Benedict, heir to this tradition, and a man of continual prayer himself, wanted to stress the connection between this personal contemplative prayer and liturgical prayer. And so, as we've said uh, perhaps too many times already, uh, inserted the verse, O God, come to my assistance, to the beginning of the canonical hours. What we see, therefore, is a profound link between the various kinds of prayer we've talked about so far. That is the Divine Office and the Psalms, Lexio Divina, meditating on all the scriptures, not only the Psalms, and this personal contemplative prayer, which, as Cashin says, leads to an intuitive understanding of the scriptures. There's a unity between these different forms of prayer. The Eucharist, on the other hand, is an entirely different category. So we'll turn our attention to that in the last two days of the retreat. This turns out to have been Alexio Bramis. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, as now, and ever shall be, world without end.